started. That's a nice prompt to remind me. And it will be available on our website in a few days. And I want to note that the views expressed in this webinar do not necessarily represent the views, policies, and positions of the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration or the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. This project is funded by SAMHSA. So this is a map of the PTTC network where, as I said, we're one of 10 domestic centers. And then there are two centers that are focused on a more national level with special populations. Um, with American Indian and Pacific Islanders, and there is another center focused on Latino health. So we will have an evaluation at the end of this presentation, and our funder wants to know how many people attended and how satisfied. You will automatically be transferred or sent to the link so that you can complete the evaluation. It's really short, just a few questions. And after you complete that, you'll all then be sent to a link for um, a PDF of a certificate of attendance, which I know is important to many of us in this time when we're trying to get credit for our online trainings. Um, so it, you'll automatically be sent or you can click on the link to go to the certificate of attendance. Now, when this webinar is done and I close it out, some of you may receive this external site warning that says, oh, watch out, you're going to an external site it's okay, that's where you're gonna complete the evaluation for this course. So don't be alarmed, you can continue. So during the course, you will be able to ask questions. There are times when questions will be proposed, proposed to the audience, and so you'll be able to respond in the Q&A box, and you'll see the three little arrows down at the bottom of your screen. That's where you can go to, to ask questions of the presenter. And we will have a Q&A at the end of the presentation. We'll respond to your questions. There's where you type them in. So this is going to be the agenda for today. Our director, Mark Wolfson, is going to introduce our speaker. And then Ivan is going to share his amazing information. And then we're going to have a Q&A session followed by really quick announcements and our evaluation. So with that, I'm going to eventually hand the power over to Ivan and Dr. Wolfson, take it away. Thank you, Kristen. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Terrific. So we are, uh, as Kristen said, uh, I'm actually the co-director. I co-direct the Southeast Prevention Technology Center with Dr. Kim Wagner. And we're really excited about this event, this webinar today. And we're excited uh, because of the topic and we're also very excited because of the speaker. So in terms of the topic, you can see that the title of this webinar is Community Engagement Strategies, Best Practices for Preventing Substance Misuse at the Grassroots Level. But what you'll see is that there's a, a, a keen focus on health disparities, and, or as I like to call them, uh, uh, health inequities, because it's really a uh, not just a difference, but it's a, a justice uh, issue in my, in my opinion. And so if you think about our region, our region of the Southeast United States, which is Kentucky, Tennessee, North Carolina, South Carolina, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, and Florida, is just incredibly diverse. And that's uh, one of the beauties of, uh, of the region. So we have uh, beautiful uh, rural areas, and we have some of the nation's largest uh, cities. Um, we also have a big swath of Appalachia in our region. So half the people who live in Appalachia live in region four, live in one of those eight states. We also have extremely high levels of racial and ethnic diversity. So we have uh, white populations, African-American populations, Latinx, Native American populations, and in, uh, especially in some of the large cities, uh, growing Asian populations. We also have high levels both of poverty and income inequality. So that sort of sets the stage in terms of the region. But we also know from the needs assessment that we've done and in our conversations with many of you that state and local agencies and coalitions often struggle to meet the needs to be able to address this incredible diversity 
uh, this incredible variety that we have in the region. And consequently, there are many communities that are underserved. And so we as a center, the Southeast Prevention Technology Transfer Center, are committed to working with you to uh, help give you the tools, help provide you with the tools and improve your capacity to, uh, to address the entire uh, uh, communities, uh, the totality of the communities that you serve. So we are just really thrilled about this uh, webinar today. So let me introduce our speaker. Let me actually, let me first give a little shout out to uh, Carlton Hall. So uh, Carlton, who is uh, a, a collaborator and a member of our uh, leadership team at the Southeast Prevention Technology Transfer Center, um, uh, brokered us, uh, connected us with uh, uh, Ivan Juzang, and we're really thrilled about that. So uh, uh, Carlton will be uh, around at the end uh, for uh, the Q&A and, and the discussion. So let me uh, introduce our uh, speaker today, our webinar presenter. So it's really my great honor to uh, introduce Ivan Juzang. So Ivan is the founder and president of Me Productions. And Me has been engaged in substance abuse prevention work since 1991 in low-income urban communities across the country. Um, so Ivan's bio says that he's been uh, doing a work here for over 25 years, but my math is that it's close to 30 years. <laughs> so I think uh, you and I are both a, a couple of the elders. Uh, various and public health issues uh, affecting uh, low-income, underserved, and devalued communities across America. He's got a really interesting background uh, for uh, someone working in prevention. His bachelor's is in mechanical engineering and his master's is in, um, uh, he has a mass, an MBA from the Warden School. Uh, he's been the member of many uh, national advisory committees. Um, so uh, without further ado, let me hand it off to uh, Ivan Juzang. Ivan? Thanks, Mark. Morning, everyone. Um, I want to just um, thank everyone for joining. I want to thank Carlton for having me. And uh, Mark, thanks for the introduction. It's been great working with Kristen uh, and getting to know folks at PTTC. So I'm um, going to jump right into it for the sake of time. Kristen said I had too many slides. So I'm going to try to get through them. I tried to reduce them, but sometimes when you're trying to get across certain content, it takes a little bit more. So if I talk too fast, I apologize in advance, but I'm gonna try to get to, through these slides so that we can get to the Q&A. Um, all right, but go ahead and uh, if you have any questions, don't don't forget to put them in the chat so we can come back and, and look at them. Um, so I'm gonna jump right into a quick overview of me productions. As Mark said, our focus is health disparities. Um, so this is a company I started back in 1990. And really our, our focus is to be the you know, a leading provider of behavioral health intervention campaigns. It's interchangeable with social marketing campaigns. But one of the things that we focus on are hard to reach underserved audiences. So I just want folks to know is uh, we, we've only focused on health disparities. We've been focusing only on health disparities since the beginning. Uh, that's obviously how long they've been around and much longer than that. So um, what why I think this may be useful for folks who, who are on this call who may not be focused on health disparities is because from our work, the hardest to reach audiences usually create the best universal appeal in terms of messaging and strategy. So I think it's applicable uh, to anyone that you may be working with. Um, here are some of the health disparities uh, areas that we're working in. So as you can see, a variety. Um, again, it, it underscores what Mark is talking about in terms of health inequities. There's not just one health disparity, there's a, there's a number. So sexual reproductive health, HIV, uh, substance abuse, teen dating violence, violence against women, uh, early childhood development, uh, physical activity, nutrition, the obesity epidemic, obviously a number of chronic diseases that are showing up now with, uh, with, the, with the pandemic that we're dealing with now, a lot of focus on um, boys and men of color who experience even higher health disparities within certain populations, uh, and then also work around suicide prevention with both young people, which it's increasing significantly, and veterans doing a lot of veterans work as well. So 
this is the kind of areas we're focused on, which obviously leads to these kind of audiences, which I just kind of mentioned in the previous slide. But you get a sense that um, obviously you're going to be focusing on certain audiences if you're dealing with groups that have the highest uh, health disparities. So probably everyone on that list, list except folks at the bottom, uh, if you're dealing with health disparities, you obviously have to work with service providers, educators, healthcare providers, and community opinion leaders. And I'll kind of talk about that as well. Our work is both urban, rural, um, uh, and so we're doing work around the country. We've also doing a lot of work and have since the beginning in, in Southeast. So we've been working in all of the states that you guys are in, uh, a lot of HIV, sexual reproductive health, some substance abuse work, a lot of work with academia. Uh, and so later on, when we get into some case studies and examples, um, I'll talk about that. Um, obviously, if, if you understand health disparities in America, they're, they're really concentrated, particularly in the black community um, in the Southeast. So um, we, we spend a lot of time in the Southeast. We have an office in Atlanta and um, constantly doing work around a variety of things. Um, let me just give you a few things because I, I, I know that uh, I may not get through all my slides. So if there's, here's, here's my takeaway slide at the beginning of the presentation. Uh, again, for audiences that are the hardest to reach, audiences that have the highest health disparities, what we've seen through our extensive audience research is that these communities tell us that no one's talking to me. No one's really talking with me, talking to me. And what that means is that we're not accounting for how they view the world. I'll get into that a little bit more, but you know, a lot of messages, particularly for hard to reach uh, underserved communities, are just not speaking to the audience. And what I mean by that is because we sometimes in our communications, we try to speak to everyone and therefore we don't speak to anyone, the community can opt out of the messaging. And so a lot of times when we have messaging that we think is, is good messaging, it's not speaking to that audience. The other thing I want to point out is a lot of times we buy into kind of media hype that these that low income communities with, with health disparities are making bad choices. I always say they're not making bad choices, they're making uninformed choices. Um, certain behaviors have only been modeled certain ways to them, so they, um, you know, they, 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 they aren't really making bad, they're just making choices within learned behavior. Um, the other thing I find out is that, you know, when you're working in, in communities that have high health disparities, there's a major trust factor. Uh, we've done extensive research funded by CDC that says, you know, do low-income African Americans and Latinos have access to healthcare? Do they have access to services? And in some cases, they don't. Particularly rural, sometimes there's there's some barriers there. But what we have found, uh, you guys, overwhelmingly, is that it's not really an access it's issue. It's a treatment issue. It's how they're treated when they get there. And so we have to understand that, you know, these communities have what we call healthy suspicion, not paranoid, but healthy suspicion of mainstream institutions, and we have to take take that into account. I'm going to talk a little bit about our model, but basically folks who are, who are familiar with the health communications model, sender message channel receiver, we flip it. And so one of the things that Mark and Chris and, and, and Carlton wanted me to focus on is tools that people can use, particularly if they have uh, small budgets. The first thing you can do is, is, is understand the, the basic model of communication, how we do it so that you can be much more culturally relevant. And by the way, it's, 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 very, it's much more cost effective. Um, we're going to talk about primary prevention. That's really my focus. Uh, even though with health disparities, you do a lot of treatment work, you do a lot of secondary and tertiary prevention work. Our focus since 2020 has really been primary prevention, and, and I'll talk about that a little bit later on. Primary prevention for me equals protective factors. So we'll talk about what that means. We Again, the media talks a lot about risk factors, but we don't talk enough about protective factors. We talk about deficits. We don't talk about strengths. And the last thing, if, 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 if uh, technology just drops off right now, one of the things I want everyone to understand is that primary prevention is doable, even though sometimes we're not funded to do primary prevention. It is doable, and obviously nowadays it's more important than ever. So the flow of the uh, webinar, and, and, and Chris is going to keep me on, on time, on track, is I'm going to talk about how we frame our prevention messages, uh, how do we get to, uh, you know, having uh, behavior change dialogue? What are the channels we use to do that? Why community engagement has to be uh, part of your toolbox? And then I'm going to try to get to, if we have enough time, get to the content that we're promoting in terms of preventing uh, uh, substance uh, misuse upstream. So primary prevention upstream, primary prevention 
and then um, a few days from now, when this goes when this goes live again after being recorded, uh, we'll make sure you have some resources, case studies, publications, et cetera, that that we can make available to you. So I'm going to jump right in. So framing the um, prevention narrative becomes important. And what, what I want to talk about is how we do it and how this is a variation of the SPF model uh, so that folks feel comfortable about what we're talking about. So what is social marketing? Social, well, let me just put it this way. The quickest way to explain social marketing is understanding consumer marketing. So consumer marketing is where we're trying to sell a product or a service. So uh, we're trying to sell Pepsi versus Sprite or we're trying to sell Reebok versus Nike. That's what we call consumer marketing. But the reality is consumer marketing is really where people are gonna make a choice knowing they, have, they, they wanna buy soda, or they're gonna make a choice knowing they wanna buy some new tennis shoes. What we're doing and what you guys are doing is what I call behavior change marketing or social marketing. Social marketing is focused on getting young people who don't use condoms to use condoms. So you see that it's a much different, uh, uh, value proposition. It's much harder. You guys need to know that. You need to value the work that you're doing because you're doing what we call social marketing or behavior change marketing. And I'll talk to you a little bit about how that fits into the SPF model. But again, if we're talking about SPF in terms of assessing needs, building capacity, planning, implementing, and evaluating, you'll see how this model uh, really uh, relates to that. So some, uh, and we have tons of these, but I just wanted to show some recent uh, substance abuse work that we're doing, um, particularly around uh, uh, tobacco prevention and the quit line, and also a lot of work um, in Ohio and other places uh, around um, uh, opioids. But we'll get to those later on. I just want you guys to understand that, that this is what we do. We do social marketing or behavior change campaigns around the country targeting folks with the highest health disparities. How do we do it? When you're dealing with folks who have high health disparities, you got to remember that they live in the context of constant stress and trauma. Uh, and so what we're always trying to do with audiences that have high health disparities is not just deal with the actual content of what we're focusing on, but we're also trying to move them and deal with them in terms of stress and trauma, uh, in terms of how they're coping currently to what we call more of a thriving position. So we're using the, the sender message channel receiver model to get folks who are making unhealthy choices to try to make healthier choices, and this is, the, this is the approach that we use, but I'll go into more detail now. So again, here's the traditional model uh, of, of, uh, of health communication. There's the sender of the message, there's the message he or she is sending, there's the channel we use to send the message, and then there's the receiver. The problem with a lot of our health communications is that it tends to be left or right, and we're not as on target as we should be. What we do is we always start with the receiver and then go right to left. So let's think about that, you know, um, and if you want to just enter into the chat, why would we start with the receiver first? Why would we start with the receiver? And then, uh, you know, you may, you may say, well, it makes sense to start with who you're trying to reach, right? But secondly, then you'd say, well, well then why would we go to the channel? And then after the channel, why would, we, why would we go to the message and then the sender? So the, the quick answer, and I'm gonna go into this in more detail, is you start with the receiver because we wanna make sure we're speaking to that person's both worldview and that we're also speaking to how that person communicates. So there's different communication styles. I'll talk about that in a minute. So you have to understand who your receiver is. And so that's the first thing. Second reason why we go to channel is really two reasons, you guys. One is we want to understand what's the best channel to meet, reach that receiver, and they will tell you. Sometimes we think it's a TV or ad or PSA, or sometimes we'll do transit or billboards. We have these notions of what the channels are, but you're going to be much more effective if you go to the receiver and ask him or her or the community itself, what's the best channels to reach you? We do a lot of population health, so it's really getting the community to answer that. And then the second part of the channel is that you may have limited resources. So sure, I could, I could do a great substance misuse um, campaign if I had $10 million to do uh, a film, but I don't have $10 million to do a film. So what's the best channel to use based on your budget? And we'll get into that in a few minutes. And then second, thirdly, what's the best message for the channel? So we say once you understand your channel, then you can put the appropriate message into that channel and then finally determine who's the best sender of the message. I don't want to insult anyone, but we may not be the best senders of the message, but if again, if you go right to left, 
the receiver will tell you who's the best sender of the message, who has the most credibility to send that message. So that's the model we do. And again, the reason why we, we focus on this is that we're really trying to counter lack of trust, but at the same time getting to trying to reduce or prevent risk behaviors while getting the respect of the target audiences that we're focusing on. And again, we're doing health disparities work, so we automatically go in understanding that trust is an issue. So uh, let's focus on the receiver for a minute. So one of the things we're all familiar with is the social determinants of health. Uh, I like Mark's uh, point about health inequities, but I always say it's not the social determinants of health when you're dealing with uh, folks who are dealing with health disparities, it's the social determinants of health disparities. In many, case, many cases, particularly in my work in, in the Southeast, and, and again, just want to be candid and honest, a lot of these communities are set up for failure. We kind of think of the social determinants of health as usually just assets. In many cases, the social determinants of health aren't assets and they're actual liabilities. So, and the reason why I mention that is because poverty and racism have a big impact on how institutions interact with both Latino and black uh, communities and even how they deal with right rural communities. Again, poor people are stigmatized in America, so sometimes uh, we think that we can treat them differently because they don't have the power to kind of advocate. So we have to understand that the receiver's worldview isn't maybe ne isn't necessarily our worldview, and we have to understand that uh, to be able to develop effective messaging and tactics for our interventions. So understanding the receiver's worldview is part of the uh, understanding the receiver. The second part of understanding the receiver is understanding his or her communications culture. So for example, uh, we do work around the country. When I get funded, I usually have to write an excellent proposal that has evaluation, that has a research component. That's what I'm what, what I mean by that is I'm talking to what we call literate-based culture. The folks who make the funding decisions really are literate-based. It's using science and all that's good. But when we go into communities, particularly poor communities of color, they're what we call our oral base. They could care less how much you've published. They could care less what the peer review journals say. Uh, they want to know, are you open to being challenged? And so there's some rules with uh, understanding the difference between literate base and oral base. And there's three main things I need you to understand about the oral tradition. One, you have the right to challenge the sender of the message. And so a lot of, a lot of times, particularly uh, us health experts, we don't want to be challenged. But if we really want to be effective, we have to be open to being challenged. That's, it's a workshop in and of itself. Uh, but understanding why uh, you want, you, I always tell people you want to be challenged because that's the community saying that they're open to a relationship to uh, with you. If they're not uh, challenging you, they're sometimes saying you're not even worthy of discussion. So the first rule is you want to be open to being challenged. The second rule, though, is that in oral tradition, the community is going to give you what we call arguments. They're going to give you arguments on why they're not engaging in the behaviors you want them to engage in. So I always ask folks who are doing prevention work, do you know the arguments? And then the third part is not only do you need to know the arguments, you have to have what we call persuasive counter arguments. The, the, the literate comparison to this is DiClemente's model of behavior change. Arguments are the equivalent of cost to changing behavior. Counter arguments are the equivalent of benefits to changing behavior. So you have to understand that in oral-based culture, you have the right to challenge a sender. They're going to challenge you with an argument. And do you have a persuasive counter-argument? So uh, it's important to understand that as you're going into communities uh, uh, with, with, pre with prevention strategies. So let me give you a quick example. Uh, I want to challenge everyone here to you know, grab a group of young people and ask them you know, uh, to, to explain to you why they smoke where, marijuana. For those, all young people don't smoke marijuana. Let's, let's not create any mess. Matter of fact, over 50% of all young people still do not smoke marijuana, but there are a lot of young people who do. But do we understand the arguments around why they smoke marijuana if we're going to try to prevent them from doing this? This is just an example. I can do the same thing for underage drinking, for heroin and opioid use, for tobacco. Do you understand the arguments, and then do you have persuasive counterarguments? So, as you guys know, it's cool, it's not addictive, it makes me creative, it's an escape from my reality. Um, a lot of young people say it should be legalized. My friends and family do it. It's healthy and natural. And so, you know, if you really, and again, I challenge folks to, to, to do this with some young people because you'll see that it's, 
it's important to understand that one, they're going to challenge you. They're going to challenge you with these arguments. And then do you have persuasive counter arguments to address this? So this is important to understand, again, worldview. And then the second thing to understand is how does the audience communicate? All right. So let me give you a quick example. Framing is important. And I always tell folks how, uh, you know, how important it is to speak to different audiences. So when I got into the substance uh, abuse prevention world, you know, we were still heavily into the war on drugs. Actually, the war on drugs started in 1972, probably before that, but really 1972 is when the uh, Nixon signed the, uh, the, the, the Drug Abuse Act. But look, you guys, on the right side, how we frame the war on drugs and who, how, we've, how we've done that framing. So primarily it's been black, brown, inner city. The way we describe it is heroin, crack, dope. Uh, we look at folks who distribute it as drug dealers and the drug cartel. We describe them as addicts or crackheads or junkies. We've taken a criminal justice approach to it. Uh, you know, we, places that they hang out are called crack houses or drug dens. And obviously, ultimately, what that leads to is perception, stereotypes, and beliefs that lead to practice policies and laws that demonize, lock up, incarcerate. Now, what I like about the opioid crisis, which is what we should have been doing on the war on drugs the whole time, is it's a different framing, right? So it's, it's, it's framed more as, listen, you know, this is a substance use disorder. This is a public health emergency. In Philadelphia, where I'm currently located, you know, we have safe injection sites that we're putting up. But again, how the community looks at it in terms of harm reduction, help saving, we should have been doing that the whole time. The interesting thing about that, and I'm, I'm collecting data right now, we're, we're thinking almost two to three trillion dollars has been spent on the war on drugs, particularly the criminalization part. We'll spend a trillion or two on the opioid crisis, but just think if we just had a trillion dollars to do primary prevention. You know, we could have dealt with a lot of this stuff a long time ago. We'll get to that. But it's important to understand uh, framing of the narrative and why it's important to do that in your work. So final point on understanding the receiver. We have to understand the receiver and we have to use a community-centered framework of right to left because the social determinants of health will change, stress and trauma are constant. We're gonna talk about digital technologies. Uh, a lot of folks come to us because we do digital technology, we do social media, we do digital ads, but folks just wanna do that and we'll talk about that. They come and go and we'll talk about how you should use them, but laws and, and perceptions and policies will change. So. The more we have a framework that enables us to adapt and respond to change, the more effective we're going to be to these respond, changing landscapes. So as you know, obviously with COVID-19, there's going to be a lot of change. This model is going to help us uh, adapt to the new COVID-19 uh, changes that are going to be uh, existing uh, in the near term. So now let's talk about the channels. People always say, well, how do I reach audiences that have high health disparities? And so what I can tell you, and we track all this, I can tell you how much consumption uh, uh, communities have around traditional media. I know how much time they spend on social media in terms of screen time. We know what websites and, and sites are important to them. We know how much they consume Pandora, Spotify, and YouTube. And so we, we understand that there's a variety of communication channels to reach the audience. But again, what I want folks to remember is you have to choose communication channels that are um, that fit your budget, and so we'll talk about what we've learned in terms of behavior change. So it's interesting. I'll, I'll let you guys in on a secret. So Coca-Cola, based out of Atlanta, they have the Sprite brand. They spend about a half a billion dollars a year selling 22 table, 22 teaspoons of sugar in a in a can of Sprite. Now that's a half a billion. We got to remember in the work that we're doing, we probably have maybe if we're lucky, 50,000. So we have to figure out what's the best channel that we can use based on our budget, and then how do we reach these audiences with behavior change messages, which we also know is harder than consumer marketing. So, you know, we have to be smarter, you guys, to try to get to the outcomes that we want to get to. So here's what the folks think when they have no budget. They go, well, let's put up a Facebook page, or let's create a brochure, or let's do a website. Well, I'm going to talk a little bit about that. You know, you know, it, it's good to use those tools and technologies, and we'll talk about that. But the question you always have to ask if you're going to deal with health disparities and behavior change 
is are you truly engaged with the communities that you serve? So what I want to do is kind of give you some of our lear learnings about uh, lessons and learnings about what channels are the most effective for the best price point. So I know you guys don't have uh, this slide on a piece of paper that you can write on, but I, if there's any notes you may want to take from this, it's, it's coming up right now. Here's what we know with the communities that have the highest health disparities. In reality, they actually consume the most media. We know low-income communities in the southeastern part of the United States spend more time in school, I mean, in more, spend more time on media and social media screen time than they spend time in school, reading, in church, and with their parents combined. They're huge consumers of screen time and entertainment media. That's the first thing you need to know. That's what they do the most, they consume media. But here's the good news. That's fine for consumer marketing, but for behavior change or social marketing, what we know is that peers have the most influence. So even though they may, they may spend a lot, lot of time consuming media, peers have the most influence in terms of behavior change, right? They, peers influence them because, again, they're hanging out, they want to fit in, all those kinds of things. Here's the part that you'll really like, hopefully, is that what we learn in our work is that adults communities and service providers have the most power. What we call it is unrealized generational power. And so what I want folks to understand is that when you're doing behavior change marketing, yes, we're gonna do stuff that is social media, digital media, websites, we're gonna take advantage of the fact that they are on their screens. But what we wanna do is more importantly, leverage the, the, the influence of peers and the power of the community itself. Uh, and so that's what I want to talk about with the remaining time that I have you left. So here we go. Uh, we're going to talk about why community engagement is critical. I already mentioned the fact that there's low levels of trust and confidence in the system, uh, addressing risky behaviors in hard to reach uh, communities actually requires dialogue. This is understanding the oral tradition. You've got to be able to dialogue with the community. But also, if you're doing more community-based strategies, the messages are there for and then reinforced uh, by community members that the audience actually knows and trusts. So that's why I want to talk about that. Here's what I want you to understand in terms of channels. I'm not saying don't use technology. Again, we do a lot of technology. I'm going to show you an ad that we just released last week in the state of Louisiana. But what we know is that technology without humanology doesn't get you behavior change. So the goal is to have a mix of communication channels, both online and what we call in community. All right. So you want to use the latest digital technologies uh, for scale and reach, but you want to use humanology or what we call community dialogue for impact. And I'll give you an example in a moment. So here's what, here's what we do with a lot of our campaigns, just to give you guys a quick example. So you see on the left, we'll have online stuff. So we'll develop a website where pe people can search for stuff by zip code. But at the same time, we're really trying to drive them offline so that we can have a conversation with them, so that we can build a relationship with them. So we'll say, hey, yeah, uh, here's a prevention resource. But at the same time, come have a tour of our prevention program. Come understand what we're doing with after school work. And then... While we're, when we're with them in the community, then we drive them back online so then we can say, hey, go get more education, watch our YouTube videos or see our Instagram videos or Instagram um, uh, TV. So we're, we're going back and forth. And the reason why we do that is because we want to engage them offline. That's understanding oral tradition. But then we want to drive them back online for more education, more how-to information, and, and to be able to, to have a relationship. Let me just tell you something quickly. We do campaigns all the time, and we've done them for obviously three decades. Anytime we just do an online campaign, the problem is, is that we haven't developed a real relationship with the community. So if we only do online, the community is getting bombarded with all kind of online stuff. But when you do offline community stuff, now, you're, now your online stuff is more of a relationship brand. So now they have a relationship with you. So when they see you online, they're going, oh, I know these folks. I know this prevention effort. And so you've got to understand that we're trying to drive the audience to focus on, on how, we make, how, how we get them to do behavior change, but it's just not going to happen online. It's a, it's a combination of technology and humanology. So I want to give you guys that as the as an example 
of how we kind of do our work. So let, let's keep going on. Let's keep going to why we want to do more community stuff. And it's not to downplay digital. We do digital all the time, but digital is not going to get you the impact. It may get you eyeballs, but it's not going to get you the impact that community engagement will be. So here's a question I want folks to answer, put in real quick. Why prioritize community engagement in your work? Why prioritize community engagement in your work? So if you can go ahead and enter that in, we'll come back to that a little bit later on. But put that answer, if you don't mind, in your, in your chat box. So again, I, I'm gonna, this is a little repetitive, but again, remember we're working with suspicious audiences. Remember we're trying to address uh, risky, unhealthy behaviors in traumatized communities that have these high health disparities, health inequities. And more importantly, we still want to do it in a way that we have an ongoing relationship with the community. I also want to make the connection now with community engagement and the uh, SPF model, because community engagement is going to help us answer some questions like, how do you truly assess needs and plan without community input? What strategies and methods are sustainable? What strategies and methods are culturally competent? What strategies and methods, for example, are trauma-informed? What's the best use of limited or reduce funding. Um, I'm just going to be candid. I've, again, been in this business for 30 years, and I'm seeing budgets being reduced. I'm not seeing budget increases. I'm seeing budget reductions. So we have to do more with less. So we have to innovate and be uh, innovative to, to get to those kinds of outcomes. So here's how we do community engagement. I want to show you the main reasons why. I'm going to get to how we do it, but I want to just spend a few minutes with the time I have remaining talking about why we do community engagement. The first reason why, you guys, is we're trying to have what we call an operational win. This is really more for us. But what we know is that if you do good community engagement, you actually create a channel. You create this communications channel that I was referring to earlier that has power. Over time, as you develop more and more relationships with community-based organizations, nonprofit, churches, all the folks that are in the community whether they're funded or not, you actually are able to put information in the community. And because we do a lot of research and sometimes you all have to do surveys or data collection, you can take information out of the community. You also get a community, the community gets a win is because as you're doing this, you're creating uh, what I call connectedness. You're creating social connectedness where folks are starting to connect more to each other. And so that gives them an incentive to start accessing uh, programs and services that may be available to them. Remember, they haven't been treated well with some programs and services, so by you engaging the community, you're automatically creating a protective barrier, protective factors for them that's going to enable them to be more comfortable to access services. So that's the first reason. Uh, you're increasing connectedness. The second, uh, and so, oh, let me give you a quick example. So we do this all over the country. We create what we call the multiplier effect. So just imagine your prevention organization is you in the middle. If you start mobilizing community-based organization nonprofits, then you start getting those folks in your network. Those CBOs have constituents. Those constituents have family, friends, and peers. This is how you get what we call the multiplier effect. And we have now developed a metric so that I can show you by doing community engagement you're going to actually have a further reach than you would have through radio ads or billboards or transit or other mechanisms. It's actually a channel. So I want you to feel confident that community engagement is not only going to help you build, rebuild trust, it's actually going to help you have a channel. So uh, just quickly, I don't, if, if folks don't know already, I'm African-American, so I don't go into a community, particularly a black community, and think just because I'm black, I have credibility. I always go through the gatekeeper. So the keys, what we call the keys to effective communication is going through the gatekeepers. The gatekeepers give you the ability to, um, to understand the environment and worldview. Remember, I talked about how important that is. By getting credibility and, and listening, you start building trust. Trust leads to access. Access leads to involvement. And then if you're inclusive with a a, a shared vision, that's going to get you value. If you include reciprocity, closing the loop, that's going to give you the strong relationship. So we have a whole process, and there's a newsletter at the end that explains all this in more detail. But I want you to understand that uh, community engagement is important, but there are the steps to effective community engagement that we'll share with you a little bit later on. All right, so in summary, community as a channel, 
You're building trust through community engagement and mobilization. And then the, the next win is that you're doing what we call social responsible community engagement. And what I mean by that is, what, particularly for my company in terms of dealing with health disparities, I sometimes go in and I'll talk about opioids, for example. But that may not be on the community's agenda. So you have to have a shared approach. So even though we may be talking about opioids, the community may want to be just talking about the ongoing trauma and disparities that they're dealing with. By actually, if I really want to get to my opioid conversation, sometimes I have to be socially responsible and engage the community in dialogue around whatever their trauma is, tap into their innate resiliency, and then get to my topic. So I just want you guys to understand community engagement means that you're addressing the elephant in the room by talking about whatever's going on in that community. And then finally, I want you all to understand the third reason why we do community engagement is because we're doing capacity building. You get a capacity building win, and this is really important for SPF. Andrew Douglas said it's easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. And I know any, everyone here is interested in primary prevention, but ultimately the more we do community engagement, the more we have the ability to transfer our skills, our primary prevention skills, into communities that ultimately start creating wellness. So if you really want to get upstream, the more we do community engagement besides the just digital technologies, the more we're actually putting skills into the community by building relationships with folks. So I want to kind of summarize this one uh, by saying that look at look at our look at our SPF model. So uh, if we want to assess needs by having a community network, that operational part, we're able to really do good data collection and understand. If we want to build capacity, we go to the capacity building win. If we want to plan, that's really all of them because we're planning not only for ourselves, but we're planning with the community. Implementation is on all levels and evaluation is on all levels. So I want you guys to understand the correlation with community engagement and, uh, and the SPF model. So. Um, now people say, well, well, how do you do it? And people always ask me, Productions, how? There's a number of, of, of strategies. We actually have three organic models that we do, but there's a lot of ways you can do community mobilization. You should start with your community advisory boards. You should have informal stakeholder meetings. Coalitions are a good way. But when you really want to start going deeper, you should have what we call chat and choose. You should do targeted community canvassing. Never in never door to door at people's house. This is public community, uh, community canvassing with CBOs, nonprofits, and other folks. Uh, you should do relationship management, and we'll go into that later, and, and one of my handouts deals with that. But there are a lot of tactics that you can use that are really very cost-effective, and they're actually uh, uh, very culturally relevant. The point is, I want you to understand why before you do the how, because we used to just teach folks how to do community get engagement in terms of the how, but there wasn't the fidelity of the model because they really didn't understand the why. I want you to understand the why before you do the how. Give you a quick case study. This falls out of uh, the Southeast region, but we're implementing this right now. So across the state of Louisiana, you guys, we have over 2,000 community-based organizations, nonprofits, all the folks that are listed on the left. We've built that up over the last four or five years. It's a channel that we now have to put information into the state of Louisiana and take information out. Let me show you where we we have over 200 just in the city of New Orleans. So this is our current map right now for New Orleans. So uh, maybe about 10 days ago now, we're working with the State Department of Health. They asked us to help them with their quit line. So this is a quick ad that we put out, uh, that we put out through digital and social media and digital billboards. But the goal was, the, I mean, but the, but but the impact was because we had our community network in place, it was reinforced by the humanology part of our efforts. So everyone's driving particularly poor African Americans to the quit line, but it, they could see the digital ads, but because they're now being contacted by their local organizations that are in the community that have credibility with them that they trust, the, the, the calls to the hotline have, have, have gone through the roof. So this is giving you an example of how you want to promote behavior change using a mix of channels. So your technology is going to be much better if you have the humanology that goes with it. So in summary, why community engagement counters trust, lack of trust, creates social fabric and referrals. Um, it's, it's interesting, when we do community engagement, a lot of folks in communities aren't even aware of each other. So 
the referral, uh, the amount of referrals goes through the roof because folks in, in a zip code may not know about other folks who are doing services in that zip code. So again, we're creating social fabric. It facilitates community dialogue. The only way you're going to get behavior change, change with, with communities that have high health disparities, particularly communities of color, is that you have to be able to have a dialogue based on the fact that they have oral communication culture. It builds primary prevention cap, uh, capacity. I want you guys to know it's actually cheaper than traditional media, but it's hard work. It takes commitment, and you have to have the right mindset. So knowing why enables the how with the fidelity of the model. So I know I'm out of time. Uh, uh, Kristen, I, I, let me just give you one more thing about the kind of messages we want to put into our, uh, into our channels, you guys. Just real quick, what we always say is that, again, what's the narrative? How do we frame our substance misuse prevention messages? We always try to say that communities, we're trying to get communities to make better choices. Um, and so there's, there's a model we use called choices, decisions, consequences, and responsibilities that we use to kind of help our frame our messages. What I want you guys to understand is that for us, primary prevention is protective factors. So the content that we're trying to focus on, you guys, is how do we put protective factors into the community? So our focus is, is, is getting communities to understand that right now, they're learning negative coping strategies to way to cope with stress. Oh, here's one thing I wanted folks to put in real quick. I forgot this, uh, Kristen. This would be a good one to, if you guys can put in the chat box. What's the number one lesson right now through, during this COVID-19 crisis that we're going through? What's the number one lesson that parents are going to teach their children as we go through this pandemic? I want you guys to tell me what's the number one thing that parents will teach their children as we go through this crisis, okay? So I want you guys to, to uh, what's the, un, what I call number one unrealized behavior, or here, here's a better way to frame it, Kristen. What's the number one unrealized behavior parents will model for their children during this, during this pandemic? What's the number one unrealized behavior? So that's what I want you guys to focus on. So we one response is wash their hands. <laughs> wash their hands. Well, that that's true. They'll they'll see parents washing their hands. The key thing is how they cope with stress. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we don't realize as parents is the number one thing we model for our kids is how we cope with stress and conflict. So in terms of substance abuse work, what we're seeing is that there's negative coping around abusing alcohol, tobacco, other drugs. There's folks who use uh, food to, to cope, right? We see comfort foods now, a big issue now, right? Uh, we've seen alcohol sales, what, double, triple in certain states. Um, but again, negative coping will be resolving. We're, we're gonna see violence against women explode over the next few months, you guys. We're gonna see abuse explode. Uh, engaging in risky sex, internalizing stress is gonna lead to more uh, chronic diseases. And we've seen a lot of our work around attempting suicide. So what we want folks to understand is that there's positive coping as well. So what we're trying to do is trauma-informed primary prevention, focusing on how to take care of yourself in a crisis, how to practice wellness, understand that there's thriving coping strategies that we can do, uh, how to be connected to caring, trusted adults. And then now more than ever, we have to be linking communities the trauma-informed services, not just healthcare, but any kind of trauma-informed services. And just so we, just so folks know, we find prevention services tend to be more trauma-informed than traditional healthcare services. So that's something to keep. So, um, and the reason why this is important, and there's science around this, um, if you have thriving coping skills and you and you get uh, subjected to trauma, some folks actually have no illness or mental disorders because they know how to cope with it. So you can, a lot of times people think because you experience trauma, you have to have a mental illness disorder. No, you can experience trauma and actually have no illness because you have, you're, you've been inoculated by having thriving coping skills. But also by having thriving coping skills, we know that you recover faster from trauma. And then finally, some people still will need what we call modern and ancient treatment but at least it helps them recover faster during that process. So here's a campaign we developed for the state of Ohio for, and this is SAMHSA funded. This is a suicide prevention campaign. Uh, it's actually being transferred right now to the Ohio Suicide Prevention Foundation. So it's not up right now, but it'll be up within the next month or so, but it's called Be Present Ohio. This is a camp primary prevention protection 
active factor campaign that doesn't use the word suicide at all because we want to get kids just to positively cope. So it's not just about suicide. It's about substance abuse. It's about violence. It's about all the different negative ways young people cope. And we want young people to be present for themselves so that they can be present for others. Um, and so right now, Me Productions with the University of Colorado, we're developing a HIPAA compliant digital tool. So you guys, I do want you to understand I'm pro digital tools. I know sometimes people don't think that after I do these presentations, it's about how we use them with humanology. So we're developing a protective factor intervention for young people that will deal with both suicide, violence, and substance misuse. So I want you guys to know about that. It's coming later on. And the three major uh, content areas will be what to do in a crisis, how to respond and adapt, how to practice wellness. So we want kids to take control and, and practice wellness means that when stress hits them in the future, it, it won't impact them as much. And then thriving coping skills, how to, how to get young people to understand that you have a plan. Having a plan is actually a thriving coping skill. And by the way, girls have plans much more than boys. Uh, girls really plan everything. They plan what they're doing this week. They're planning what they're going to do for their careers. They're planning things for their boyfriends that they don't even know about. It's the boys that are rudderless. Boys are out there, da-da-da-da-da. And so when trauma hits them because they don't have a plan, it actually impacts them more. So teaching boys how to have a plan is critical to them being able to thrive through stressful situations. Last slide. Here's, here's my work for the next five years. We're focusing on trauma-informed primary prevention. At the top, the content is protective factor resiliency. We're trying to teach young people resiliency skills. Uh, uh, we're trying to uh, get that both online and offline, but the offline part is helping prevention coalitions effectively mobilize their communities. And then the last part is because some communities, because of the health disparities and equities, they still need to be linked to trauma-informed primary health care treatment and recovery services. So this is what I'm trying to do in the next five years before I retire, hopefully. But again, it's, 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 and this is what I hope folks get from this presentation, that, you know, yes, we want you to have technology. We want you to do social media, digital stuff, but combine it with the humanology, that's going to give you the impact. All right? Whew. All right. That's it. I, just so you guys know, in the next few days, few days you'll get all of our available uh, campaign stuff, publications, we have it in all these different categories. So I'll stop there. It's in the PowerPoint that you'll get. You'll see some examples of all of this stuff. I'll just kind of flip through it so you guys can see it now. But we have just different things that are be available to you guys to use as examples, including some of our newsletters, et cetera, training platforms, stuff like that. So thanks, Kristen, Mark, Carlton. Sorry for flowing too fast there at the end, but I wanted to try to be sensitive to time and questions. That's okay. We we understand. I do want to let everyone know that these that this is being recorded and the slides will be available in a PDF on our website in a few days. Everyone has my email if you're unsure where to go, but our website is pttcnetwork.org slash southeast. So um, I did have a I've got one question right now from the audience and then I'm gonna hand it to Carlton, but someone asked, what are your thoughts regarding access deserts? meaning that the nearest healthcare facility is over an hour and away and the community does not have broadband. Yeah, I, what, I think what we find in communities that are in these access deserts, and, and this is where we do need to take advantage of technology, right? So this is one of the things that we will do, but technology without the humanology, again, becomes important. So when things ease up and we're able to do community engagement, we really need to do it so that when we are in these situations, in the future, you know, people will know and have a relationship with us. That's how then we can leverage technology. So for example, what we find in a lot of low income communities, texting is still the number one form of electronic communications that they like. So if you have a relationship with someone, yeah, obviously you can't text them if you don't know them, it's just spam. But when we have relationships with folks, texting works. Email works with older uh, folks who still like their email. They don't wanna be on all this social media stuff. And then obviously Facebook for older folks, Instagram for younger people. And then what we know is the number one form of social media is actually YouTube. So having good YouTube videos, we develop videos all the time because they reflect the oral communication culture. If you look at a me video, it has both the argument and counter argument in the video. That way the community goes, oh, you're talking to me. You're talking to my worldview. 
You're talking to my arguments, and you're educating me with counter arguments. So there's a lot of good tactics that people can use, but again, it's all built on having community engagement so that they trust your technology. I think telemedicine, just on, you know, if you have a relationship with communities and you don't have good uh, internet access, phone will work. These communities still like phones. So a lot of the stuff we're doing in Louisiana, our community-based organizations get on phones with their constituents and just say, hey, are you all right? Are you doing this? Or they're texting. So we don't always have to have the latest technology. We have to have the relationship to use whatever technology we have that, that our relationships exist within. So I still know a lot of folks that Me Productions will put out our social media and folks will say, I, I'll say, well, did you see our great social media? They're like, no, but if you send it to me in an email, I'll be more than happy to look at it. So we have to understand that it's not one size fits all. We want to leverage them all within the context of a relationship with the community. Right. Carlson, did you have something you wanted to ask or share? Well, you know what, um, uh, because of time, uh, I just want to say, um, uh, Ivan, it was an extraordinary presentation. Thank you so much. Um, I, I'll share that, you know, we've been saying quite a bit across the nation uh, that while we're dealing with things such as an opioid crisis or vaping crisis or whatever the crisis of the, jaw, uh, of the day happens to be, um, we really are suffering from a crisis of engagement. And in that, uh, you said something that I thought was key at the beginning. You said trying to speak to everyone, you often end up speaking to no one. And I feel as though uh, we oftentimes fall into that trap. Could you speak about that a little bit more and, and share with us what you think are maybe uh, some of the biggest errors um, that that many of us make in trying to engage the broader community. There's a reason why we don't get beyond the usual suspects very often when we're trying to reach and engage them with these life-saving um, resources that we have. Yeah, I, I think the easiest way to frame it is when you try to speak to everyone, if, and if you want to do that, what we have to remember is that you then have to use literate-based culture. You're not going to speak to folks who are oral-based that way. And the reason why I say that is because when you're, you're you're, you're, you're trading off a level of education, a, a level of literacy, right? Things like that. That's fine, and, and we do that all the time. But if you're going into communities that have the highest health disparities, what they do is they opt out. And we see this in a lot of our campaigns. The community can easily say, particularly if you see something that uh, is too multicultural or too this or that, they'll say, okay, but you're not speaking to my reality. This is the issue we're working with a lot of clients on this COVID-19, particularly in poor Black and Latino communities. What these communities are saying is that, yeah, I can't do social distancing. That's great that you can do it, but you're not giving me information within my environmental context, right? You see what I'm saying? So if my environmental context is different, how do we make sure that we know that these are the communities that are going to really be impacted by the COVID-19, that we speak to what they can do? And this gets back to those three areas. First thing we need to do when COVID-19 is what to do in a crisis. So this is the hand washing, whatever distancing you can do, uh, stuff like that. Practicing wellness is primary prevention. Getting your immune system up, start resting, st don't stress yourself out on this, things like that. And then upstream on the thriving stuff is you got to start thinking about the new economy that's going to come out of this if you're a poor person of color, for example. There's going to be a new economy. How am I going to start thinking, what's my plan to figure out how I'm gonna thrive in the new world that comes out of this. So it's all about trying to make sure we speak initially to that audience where he or she is at, and that's within the context of stress and trauma. They're in a crisis, and, and this is part of the problem when people are criticizing low-income communities for not doing the right thing. They right. already had a crisis going before this crisis. They were just in that crisis. Right. Right. So you now have a new crisis that's just adding on to the four other crises that they had. So again, almost like you gotta get in line and so if you don't do communications that speaks to why they have to put this on the higher priority, your message is, 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 is they're going to just opt out of your message. Man, I right. wish we could engage like this for, for a bit more, but I know our time is out. Thank you so much for, for the presentation. Kristen, I'm going to turn it back over to you. All right. Thank you so much. So I wanted to bring everyone's attention before you jump off to this QR code. If you, I would hold up my smartphone, but my son just took it on a Zoom with his friend. Um, but if you take your smartphone and turn on the camera and hold it over this QR code, your phone will send you right to the link for the evaluation and you can fill it out there 
And then you can go right into the certificate of attendance. So I'll leave that up for a minute, and then in just a second, I'll bring up our contact slides. Um, if anyone needs to reach out to us, if you have any questions, and hopefully we can have Ivan back and sort of do a part two. The, the comments, for some reason, the chat box is not allowing everyone to see, but people were loving this presentation. And there are some other questions that we don't have time to address, so I Kristen, really apologize. The QR code is not showing. It's not showing? Correct. You got to give it. You got to take it back from Ivan. I'm sorry. Oh, all right. Let me do that. <laughs> so strange. <clears throat> because we're both sharing the exact same thing, but so here it is. Can you see it now? And I circled it in red so you don't miss it. So thank you, Mark, for letting me know. So you guys can put your, like I said, put your camera right over that and it'll send you to the evaluation. And if anyone has any problems getting that certificate of attendance, reach out to me and I will be sure to get it to you. But do take a moment to share your feedback on this evaluation. We love knowing what you think and so does our funder. So, I'm, we're going to close it out. I'm going to stop recording it, um, but I'm going to leave it up for just a few more minutes in case people need to.